Um, with that, we will go ahead and get started um, today. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, on our third Padres Pedal to Cause Road to Discovery series. Um, I'm Ann Marburger. I'm the Executive Director of Padres Pedal. Um, and I know many of you on the, on the line have heard from us and participated for years and years. And I also know that some of you are new. So um, if you're new and joining for the first time, our mission is to accelerate cures for cancer by funding collaborative research and clinical trials among San Diego's top research and care institutions. Um, and today is an opportunity to hear from one of the tremendous teams that we've funded over the past few years. Um, over the past several weeks and months, we've had the honor and privilege to share updates from a few of these different research teams that we've funded. And then, of course, today we have a phenomenal panel um, of researchers and care providers from UC San Diego Health um, who are experts on a very rare form of gastrointestinal cancer, um, which is called gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or GIST. Uh, and so if you missed our previous webinars, um, you can view those on our Padres Pedal to Cause YouTube page, where we will also post um, this recording after today. Uh, in just a few minutes, I will introduce um, the team received funding from Padres Pedal to Cause in 2018 um, for an open label phase two clinical trial testing the e efficacy of a drug called temozolamide um, on, a, on a subset of GIST patients. So, um, we're going to get the chance to hear directly from that team in just a minute. And I mentioned earlier that um, today we're going to be talking about GIST. Um, and to set the stage for that, GIST is a very rare cancer. Um, it makes up less than 1% of gastrointestinal tumors. Um, each year, about um, four to 6,000 patients in the, in the United States are diagnosed um, with this disease. And over just the last week, we've had the good fortune of meeting an amazing young woman who's pictured here, Sheila. Um, and we got to meet her and her fiance, husband, Brady, um, who's also with us today, and we're going to hear from him in just a minute. But um, Sheila is actually a patient of Dr. Sicklick and the team at Morris Cancer Center. And um, she couldn't be with us today because she's pursuing her PhD and she had class, but we thought her story was just so inspirational. Um, we also have Brady um, with us today. And it was quickly apparent to us when we met um, Sheila and Brady that they were a team. I um, in addition to the team that they have at Morris Cancer Center, they are a team like no other. Um, and he's been and continues to be an incredible cheerleader and, and just sidekick uh, to Sheila. And so um, one of the things that he uh, mentioned, he said, we want to have a long life together. And that requires Dr. Sicklett to do his work. It requires Padres Pedal the Cause to do your work um, and for them to do their work. And so he's with us today. Um, and Brady, thanks for, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. One of the things that Sheila shared also was that, you know, she had this decade of health um, and then it came back and she mentioned this part about it sort of being a chronic disease for her. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that we want to explore with the panelists going forward. Um, but one thing that I also just wanted to hear your impression, Brady, of working with Jason and the team of what, what that has been like um, for you um, and what it means kind of going forward for you too. None of us ever really know like what's going to happen tomorrow or, you know, how secure we are in our own health or our, you know, family or loved one's health. Um, but with Sheila and I, like, we really know like what we're up against. Um, and it's a long-term process and it's a scary disease. Um, and so we real we need a team um, and we need, we need ongoing advancements. And I need that. I need her to be around for a really long time. Um, and so that means that we need to constantly be figuring out what's the next thing, what's the next treatment. Um, with that, we do have um, the three-part team that Padres Pedal to Cause um, funded back in 2018. Um, and we have um, Dr. Jason Siklik, who's a professor of uh, surgery at UC San Diego Morris Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Adam Bergone, who's a medical oncologist uh, at Morris Cancer Center. And then Dr. Christian Matalo, who is an associate professor of bioengineering. So very diverse um, backgrounds and a great story of how you all came together. Perfect. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our story today. And, um, you know, the story of Brady and Sheila is, is why we do this. You know, it's, uh, you know, that, this is what keeps us going. You know, when times are rough, you know, stories like this are, are, are fuel for us.
So uh, GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumor is a tumor that, uh, as I mentioned, is a sarcoma, meaning that it arises from not the lining of our, of our GI tract as we might expect of sort of common colon cancer or stomach cancer, but it arises from the nerve cells that um, are in the wall of our intestine. And these are the cells that actually are thought to be the, the pacemaker cells of our gut, meaning that just like we have cells in our heart that tells our heart to beat and we don't have to think about you know every moment when our heart takes a you know beat just the same way when we eat food there's cells in our intestines that tell our intestines when to peristalsis or when to move and so that food gets moved down in this way again we don't have to think about it these are the cells that give rise to gist so as you can imagine these cells are everywhere from the esophagus all the way down to the to the end of the GI tract. And so GIST can occur anywhere from the top to the bottom of our GI tract. What started becoming more apparent is that there were younger people that were also presenting with these tumors in their teens, in their 20s, their 30s, so much younger than we would expect them um, to present. And so what that ultimately led to was the discovery that some of these tumors were not caused by this kind of classic mutation in this gene, this kit gene that, that I was alluding to before, but in genes that are regulating metabolism, or as, uh, as Christian was mentioning, the, the ability, the, the, the mechanisms in our cells that regulate the ability to, for the cells to use sugar and to basically survive. And it turned out that these, these tumors you know, we're only a small subset of the four to 6,000 GIST patients that you mentioned every year, somewhere on the order of probably 200, maybe 300 at the most per year in the US. This is occurring in young people, so adolescents, young adults, is that most of these are hereditary, meaning they're passed from parent to child. So you've added now a third layer of complexity to this. It's young people, you know, we don't have good drugs and it's families affected, it's not just oh, you had bad luck, you're the one person that got it, you know, or you smoked too much or you drank or whatever, that was your predisposing factor. This is just the, the luck of the draw of, you know, who our parents were and how we were born and what genes were passed on, fortunately. And so that's kind of what led us to then start investigating this, um, this subtype of GIST and not just GIST in general, where we really start trying to subset out and really focusing on one group of patients and trying to tackle that rare subset rather than saying we're going to treat everybody all the same and that we can really think about personalizing this treatment for each for each individual. So Leva Karamatinib, as um, Jason was talking about that drug discovery, as well as other tyros, uh, drugs in that class of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, really work well for you know up to 90% really of our GIST patients. Um, we just have to uh, just not forget that we do have this subset of people that have been subcharacterized. And um, I think of that frustration of feeling like someone with a rare tumor that's left behind. Um, it just highlights, I think, the importance of us being able to have the funding available to do these clinical trials for these rare uh, subsets of uh, patients, even within rare tumors. So, in the same way, so that we need energy to move around and think and, and all those tissues need that. A tumor which is trying to grow and the immune system from attacking it also has very large energetic needs. And by identifying and understanding how those cells aren't, are, are not working properly, the hope is that we can come up with more a distinct molecular ways to, to, to get at and kill those, those tumor cells. And, and that's what the approach really is that we've been taking with, uh, with, with Jason's laboratory. And at the same time, this will ultimately feed into other treatment options that we can investigate to kind of add on to particular diets or, or other manipulations that may improve treatment further. So it really started bridging between, you know, my laboratory studying GIST, being able to grow the cells, getting the tissue from the from the operating room when I can when I operate on these patients to Adam seeing the patients, treating them with with the drugs, 
to being able to then hand off cells to, to Christian in his laboratory to be able to study the metabolism of these cells and how, because of these STH mutations, the metabolism is altered and what other potential other targets might be available. And so that's really where, you know, all the parts of the puzzle started coming together to make this, this team come together that you would otherwise think maybe didn't fit so, together so well. And so really it's a marriage of my clinical practice with my laboratory that helps kind of keep fueling this forward where, you know, we're doing this from bench to bedside and bed, bedside to bench and back and forth. And it's a, it's a constant iterative process. I think it's really important to note here that as Jason was, you know, kind of outlining the backstory, we had a lot of evidence from both the lab and from our own experience in the clinic at the cancer center using temozolomide in just patients um, of the FCH sub, uh, deficient subclass. And we were really kind of ready and raring to go with this project and we had this clinical trial in mind. So the pedal funding really allowed us to launch that project immediately as to, opposed to waiting for, you know, long periods of you know, applying for outside funding mechanisms and potentially getting rejections. So we were able to really get the trial up and running uh, quickly in 2019. Um, and we uh, have been uh, successful in enrolling six patients so far on the study. Um, keep in mind, this is an extremely rare disease, a few hundred uh, patients per year. Um, and we actually have patients coming from all over the country to um, see us here for evaluation for the trials. Um, the other, you know, great opportunity from this from this grant and, you know, getting the trial up and running here at UCSD um, is it has allowed us to, you know, successfully apply for other funding mechanisms um, to expand the reach of the trial and we'll now be expanding the trial to five additional sites throughout the country as a, as a result of the you know, seed money that we got from Puddle to really launch this project. And we eventually actually were able to get funded through the FDA to help continue to support the trial as we grow it. That funding also allows us to do a secondary uh, aim, which is to not only run the trial, but to start identifying other vulnerabilities in these cells at the, si at the basic science level, working with Christian and trying to identify are there other agents or other combinations of drugs that we can put together in, with temozolomide in order to sort of, you know, not just knock out one leg of the table, to, but to start maybe knocking out multiple legs of the table so that so the tumor falls down, if you will, or the table falls down, you know, because it's, it's great to have disease control, but it's even better if we can have disease responses. And so, um, and so that's really the next thing that we're working on. It starts opening up the potential of understanding how to treat other diseases based upon understanding just better. And then as time is going on, we're starting to learn that there's a lot of other disease types like liver, like bile duct tumors that occur within the liver that have mutations in other members of the um, metabolism pathways that, have, that are driving those diseases. And so kind of going back to, as we understand more about metabolism and how mutations are driving the biology of these tumors, we can better understand what are some of the mechanisms that are you know, underlying vulnerabilities or other driver mechanisms that we don't necessarily understand right now, how to target these tumor types, you know. You know, this is a really rare disease and there aren't a lot of people working on it and there aren't a lot of opportunities for um, development in it. And so, so we need your help. Um, so we, we need, we need um, folks like you to be supporting um, Christian and Adam and Jason and everyone who's working on this because, you know, there's two different ways to think about impact. There's like the quantity and then there's the quality. And, you know, a lot of people go for quantity, like how, how much is this spreading? How many different people are being affected? And I also think it's just really important to think about the quality. Um, there are those few of us, myself and Sheila included, who um, have no hope without teams like this, without contributions from y'all. Like we, we just, the life we want isn't there unless we get helped. And so um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for contributing to, you know, um, Padre's Pedal and contributing to this team because we, 
we desperately need it. And the impact that it has on our lives is um, unexplainable. Um, but we've talked about collaboration. We've talked about seed funding. Um, we've talked about hope and how this is translating from the bench side to the bedside and to individual lives like Brady and Sheila. And I think there's two other things that come forward and uh, that we haven't touched on. And one of those is just the concept of a multiplier and that um, Padres Petal provided seed funding for one trial and Sheila was patient zero. And now the trial in only a year, year and a half is rolling forward at five different sites across the country. And that's just really exciting for us to see that um, the dollars that Padres Petal participants are raising is going on to create this snowball and this multiplier. And that gets us really excited. Um, and the, the second thing is just how special San Diego is. Um, and that Brady and, and Sheila were um, given this bad news in San Francisco, and they didn't let that stop them. They came to, to San Diego and to Moore's Cancer Center. And um, although today we don't have some of the other beneficiary institutions on the panel, um, they're here asking questions, um, and they were on some of our last panels. So San Diego is just a, a phenomenal place to, to do research and to collaborate, and, and we're excited to have you all with us and to be part of it. So. Um, with that, I think today has been just such a phenomenal experience to learn more about the, the trial that we funded and to learn about Brady and Sheila. Um, I have to give thanks um, to you, Brady and Sheila. Uh, we'll, we'll, of course, send her the recording of this, but for having the courage to share your story. Um, we can't wait to meet you in person. Um, and thanks also to the team, Jason, Adam, and Christian, for everything that you do and for being such tremendous stewards. Um, we'd love to continue funding your research, and uh, we're not stopping now. And, um, and thanks to the fundraisers and participants and donors um, on the line for making this all possible. Hopefully it's clear that every dollar we raise is having a great impact.